We're going to have our first speaker, and I'm, I'm really delighted to, uh, to welcome him here. He's only been here a few hours, so you have to give him a break. He's had two and a half hours of sleep, I think. Um, Peter Sawcheck, uh, representing the Organization for the Prohibition of Chemical Weapons. I'll try to say that out all the time, as opposed to OPCW. Um, Peter is actually the head of government relations and pu uh, political affairs at the OPCW. The OPCW is a is a you know implementing agency now, 18 years old I think, with about 500 individuals there, very multilateral, international in scope, headquartered in the Hague, right right across the the street from uh, the International Criminal Court for Yugoslavia. Uh, Peter was previous senior advisor on international security to. Uh, as you'll hear from his accent, the Australian foreign minister, um, although I think the Australian accent's not too heavy. Uh, he was director of counterproliferation at the Australian Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade uh, and was, has been posted in the past in, uh, in, in Washington, uh, Brussels, and Moscow. Uh, he's also an adjunct research fellow at Monash University, those of you who know Monash, in and um, uh, in, in around Melbourne. Australia. So we're really delighted. Um, I know I know Peter from the OPCW in The Hague, and he was very gracious to agree in a very busy time when the Conference of States Parties is coming up in just less than a month, three and a, three and a half weeks, I think, uh, of which many of us will be there um, to really come all the way here to Israel and spend some time with us. So, uh, Peter, the floor is yours. That's great. Thanks, Paul. Um, you, given that I only slept two and a half hours, I feel very fresh, but I think I'd rather not stand. So if you bear with me, I'll, I'll sit here. Well, certainly it's a great pleasure to be back in Israel. I, I actually did visit before in a previous incarnation when I was working at the Australian Foreign Ministry looking after Middle East affairs. I came on a visit. Um, and uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm, much, I'm more pleased to be here now to talk about something I actually know about rather than regional security politics. Um, I should also have known better but, um, to not wear a tie. Paul, I think we're the odd men out here, and we obviously haven't got enough Israel experience behind us to realize that <laughs> probably half the Israeli cabinet doesn't know how to actually tie ties, but uh, and there it is, so I'll take it off for tomorrow. Um, when Sharon and Paul approached me about um, this event, um, I was given a keynote address, which sort of freaked me out, because I'm actually the speechwriter for our director general, and I write, write speeches for him. I've never written a speech for myself. Um, I, I stupidly did so, so I do have some comprehensive notes. I'll go through them, but you know, in, the, in the vein of this being an interactive, informal discussion, without ties, um, I obviously will welcome the opportunity to have questions afterwards, including in more detail about things that are topical, such as Syria, the Syria mission. So, um, but let me acknowledge from the very outset the organizers of the event, once again, um, you know, Green Cross International, CWC Coalition, and of course the Israeli disarmament movement, and in particular Paul and, and Sharon as a driving force behind, behind them and uh, the organization of this event. So to my mind, um, there are three events that very clearly serve to frame our discussion over the next two days on the Chemical Weapons Convention, or CWC, I will use acronyms. First, as already has been mentioned, in 1993, Israel signed the CWC under the prime ministership of Yitzhak Rabin. Second, last year, the CWC's implementing body, the OPCW, was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize, as had been Mr. Rabin, of course, previously. And third, at about the same time last year, Syria joined the convention, and its chemical weapons have since been destroyed. So effectively, what these three events mean for informing any discussion on Israel's stance in relation to the CWC is this. One, that Israel has previously determined that the CWC is squarely in its interests. Two, the OPCW is doing its job successfully. And three, Israel no longer faces a strategic threat from chemical weapons. So my purpose in these opening remarks is to provide an account of the second point, how we've uh, done our work of global chemical disarmament. So to this end, I'll draw on the, unique, on the unique aspects of the convention. I'll also touch on how the Syria mission has put the CWC through its paces, as well as on emerging, emerging challenges. But I hope that my presentation will also help anchor our discussion for addressing the other two points, specifically how Israel stands to derive diplomatic, economic, and security dividends from ratifying the CWC. So, 
to my mind, certainly, it's no overstatement to say that the CWC is the most successful treaty in multilateral arms control history. Since the convention entered into force in 1997, the OPCW and its member states have presided over what can only be fairly described as prodigious progress in global chemical disarmament. Certainly, the facts speak for themselves. To date, we have verif verified the destruction of some 86% of all declared chemical weapons. The complete destruction of remaining weapons is now well within our grasp. This is not some highfalutin objective in the future, our children's children's future. Within the next few years, we will have destroyed existing chemical weapon, declared chemical weapon stocks. The OPCW has also conducted more than 2,500 inspections of industrial facilities in more than 80 countries, and we're continuing to do so at a rate of about 241 per year. We've also unrolled programs and activities across the globe to help member states better protect their populations against chemical attacks and incidents, um, as well as to foster international cooperation in peaceful uses of chemistry. So in short, the CWC and OPCW represent what I like to call the holistic regime geared towards not only defending against misuse of chemistry, but also ensuring that the benefits of chemistry reach all nations. How we got to this point is a compelling story of fitful but determined efforts seeking to outpace what has been a century of chemical warfare through arms control and disarmament measures. The high point of this story was, of course, negotiation of the CWC at a time when the brutal attacks of the Iran-Iraq war were focusing minds of negotiators in Geneva, but it has also happened at a time when there was a new spirit of cooperation between the superpowers at the end of the Cold War. So in some ways, the CWC was really uh, so successfully negotiated as a victim of good timing in a large part. But I won't go through the details of how we negotiated the CWC. That's one for the, for, for the record books. What I will do instead is to account for what makes the CWC unique and how um, this underwrites the Convention's success and ongoing effectiveness. So first of all, the Convention prohibits not only the use of chemical weapons, but also their development, production, stockpiling, transfer, and retention. This is something that was sorely missing in the chemical weapon instruments preceding it, the 1925 Geneva Protocol and the 1899 Hague Convention, which focused unsuccessfully on banning use. Secondly, the Convention is non-discriminatory. This means that each and every member state enjoys exactly the same rights and is subject to exactly the same obligations. So unlike the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, there are no haves and have-nots. There are no chemical weapon states sanctioned by the treaty. No one is entitled to produce or stock chemical weapons, period. Those members that have such weapons, about eight have been declared since the CWC came into force, are obliged to destroy them, while those that do not have them are obliged never to acquire them. Thirdly, the Convention is backed by an international verification regime. In other words, its members can draw confidence from the fact that the OPCW polices the Convention through monitoring and inspection activities. The only other treaty that bans an entire class of weapons of mass destruction, the Biological Weapons Convention, has no such verification regime. And some of you might recall that there was an attempt to negotiate a verification protocol to the BWC in the uh, um, uh, late 90s, but that failed. So, um, effectively, only the CWC can really hold its members to account. The verification regime means regular inspections of industrial facilities of interest around the globe, as I've indicated. It also means provision for challenge inspections, the current gold standard in verification. Any member state can request an inspection at short notice of a facility in another member state if it has credible grounds for suspecting non-compliance on that member state's part. We can discuss this in more detail later, but you know, I like to think that the fact that no challenge inspection has been held to date points to the strong deterrent value that this provision has 
as well as the integrity of the consultative mechanisms that attend it. Finally, the CWC comprises, as I've already mentioned, a holistic regime based on four mutually reinforcing pillars, disarmament, non-proliferation, assistance in protection, and cooperation on peaceful uses of chemistry. As such, it's based on more than universal consensus on the indivisibility of chemical security. It act actively facilitates international cooperation that, that tracks and destroys chemical weapons, as well as protects against their use and denies opportunities for their re-emergence. So based on these provisions, and more than 20 years after it was concluded, the Convention remains the only legally binding international treaty banning an entire class of weapons of mass destruction under international verification. These unique provisions amount to more than fine words. They provide vehicles for turning them into deeds. And as a result, there can be no question of chemical weapons having any strategic warfare future for as long as the Convention remains in place as the well-established norm that it is today. More recently, of course, the OPCW's credentials have been burnished by the unprecedented mission to eliminate serious chemical weapons. The confirmed use of chemical weapons in Syria in August last year made it clear that our success, that of the international community against chemical weapons, can only be as broad as is our reach. International reaction to the brutal attacks in Ghouta near Damascus also reminded us that chemical weapons are unacceptable in any quarter. It sent a clear signal to Syria about the liability posed by its chemical weapons, and it showed that the world's nations are prepared to invest heavily in ensuring they're eliminated. Syria's subsequent accession to the Chemical Weapons Convention, as unanticipated as it was, opened the way for a rapid succession of events. Just over one year later, all of Syria's declared chemical weapons have been removed, 98% of them have been eliminated, and Syria's capability to produce new weapons is no more. I'll not describe the details of these achievements here. They're a matter for the public record, which, by the way, the OPCW has been assiduous in keeping transparent and up-to-date through regular reporting. What I will point to, however, is how the Syria mission proved the resilience of the Convention and what lessons we've drawn from this. For the OPCW, these lessons relate to having had recourse to an authoritative but flexible plan, a well-subscribed funding and technical assistance base, well-coordinated international cooperation, technical innovations, and effective public-private partnerships. All these elements have underwritten the Syria mission First of all, the reason why the international community was able to act so swiftly is because it had no need for a specially mandated ad hoc international arrangement, as we've seen in the past, Iraq being a case in point. The convention presented a ready-made, tried and tested vehicle for agreeing and implementing a destruction plan. Second, our member states were able to show sufficient flexibility to bend the letter of the law of the convention to better exude its spirit and act on what was, of course, a very rare disarmament opportunity. This meant agreeing, at the Syrian government's request, to remove declared chemical weapons for destruction outside the country, despite a formal requirement by the CWC for destruction to be undertaken by possessor states. Third, we could count on a collective, well-coordinated international effort. More than 30 of our member states provided generous in-kind and financial assistance for the mammoth task of removing and destroying some 1,300 metric tons of chemical agent. This required unprecedented levels of cooperation, in large part amid an active conflict in very compressed time frames. The support ranged from providing transport vehicles, packing equipment and cargo vessels, to dispatching naval escorts, and opening up government and commercial facilities for the destruction of chemicals. A key element of all of this was our cooperation with the United Nations. The UN's provision of field, security, and logistical support was crucial for our inspectors who had previously not deployed in active conflicts. Fourth, we were able to overcome political and security obstacles through innovative technical solutions. 
When no country, for example, was willing to host land-based destruction in its jurisdiction, the United States devised a sea-based platform aboard its vessel, the Cape Ray, to neutralize Syrian chemicals. This creative solution saw the destruction of Syrian stocks of sulfur mustard and main precursor chemicals, some 600 tons in total, in a remarkably short period of time, in an effective, safe, and environmentally sound way. And to monitor activity at Syrian chemical weapons facilities to which we could not gain physical access owing to the conflict, we employed remote GPS-mounted cameras. Finally, we pioneered public-private partnerships in expediting the destruction of some of the chemicals from Syria's weapons program, as well as the effluents resulting from the operations aboard the Cape Ray. Given that many of the chemicals used in Syria's chemical weapons program were industrial, commercially traded chemicals, the OPCW devised a solution for dealing with them by putting their disposal to commercial tender. At the end of the of the solicitation process, two companies, Ekakem of Finland and Veolia of the United States, were awarded contracts to undertake this task. So from all of this, one thing is abundantly clear. While overseeing the destruction of a chemical arsenal is routine business for our organization, there's clearly been nothing routine about how we went about this in the extraordinary case of Syria. The fact that we were able to do so with such a high degree of success reinforces the importance of having a reliable textbook, such as the CWC, but also the ability to write and add new chapters as we go. For I'm sure we can all agree here that no opportunity to rid the world of a major weapons of mass destruction arsenal should be overlooked. And because none of us could have foreseen Syria's accession to the CWC a little over a year ago, we need to ensure that we can respond to future contingencies as a matter of course. Syria has, of course, preoccupied us over the past year, and with good reason. But it's also thrust the work of the OPCW into the international limelight in ways we have never before experienced. In fact, I like to describe my job when I, because I joined the OPCW when Syria joined the OPCW in mid-September. And in some ways, if you can imagine the OPCW, OPC what? Nobody had ever heard about it before the Nobel Peace Prize. As the folks in grey overalls, there's the world's theatre, the world stage, and the world theatre, the house of the world stage. And the OPCW were the people in the overalls who made sure the lights worked, that the plumbing wasn't too loud, and so forth. And suddenly, they win the Nobel Peace Prize, and they're thrown onto centre stage. And they didn't have a text, they didn't have a script, because, of course, we were used to working behind the scenes. But this has been the Nobel Peace Prize with the Syrian mission have, has, of course, given us an extraordinary level of uh, international scrutiny, and we're very pleased about that. But in all of this, you know, we are getting out of the verification destruction business, despite Syria. It's important to remember that the OPCW is undergoing a historic transition. As the destruction of declared chemical weapons rapidly nears completion, the OPCW is just as rapidly readjusting its priorities. Broadly, this means shifting our focus away from getting rid of existing weapons, with 86% 86, 86 so far being destroyed, to preventing new ones from reappearing. This is a qualitatively different, far more difficult task, and one that is far less visible in the public eye. The changing strategic landscape in which we're undergoing this transition is equally complex. It's enough to cite the impact that globalization is having on the structure of chemical industry and what this means for how we conduct inspections of the future. New advances in science and technology that may call into question how we verify compliance with the convention and the revolution in digital communications that serve to enhance and multiply transfer of know-how that could be misused. For example, new improvements in chemical production technology will lead to new possibilities for small-scale production of chemicals. This will potentially present new verification challenges as the range of facilities capable of making and handling dual-use chemicals increases significantly. Likewise, the growing convergence of biology and chemistry could call into question the integrity of our current monitoring mechanisms. But a far more invidious challenge one that current global non-proliferation norms are ill-equipped for dealing with, is that posed by non-state actors. Terrorist groups have made no secret of their aim to acquire 
and to use weapons of mass destruction. In the case of chemical weapons, the dangers are very real, especially if we consider the threat posed by options for using conventional means to bring about a toxic chemical incident. We should all be very concerned that not only are chemical weapon related materials and technology relatively accessible, terrorists are not deterred by the same disincentives that states are. But despite this at times grim horizon, we at the OPCW are confident that we can turn challenges into opportunities. New technological developments can enhance methods of gathering, transmitting and retrieving data which might help with monitoring and verification. For example, through a secure information exchange project, the OPCW has established a tool for states' parties to share their declarations and information on transfers of chemicals by electronic means. This equally applies to new communication tools as evidenced by the role that social media has recently played in bringing new sources of data to our attention. This certainly applies to the ongoing fact-finding mission in Syria investigating allegations of chlorine gas use, but also played a role, of course, in establishing what happened in Khota in August last year. So broadly, rather than just control materials and technologies, we need to also work to co-op new partners in a new approach based in, in responsible science and industrial practice. One statistic that my scientific uh, uh, advisory colleague at the OPCW likes to cite is there are 15,000 new chemical compounds, substances added to the chemical abstracts database every day. We can't hope to control every new chemical that comes out. And we shouldn't try to. What we need to do is to create more active partnerships. And I think we'll probably have the opportunity to talk about that. The CWC, for instance, was negotiated with scientists around the table as well as industry. And whatever the concerns states have about inspections of industrial facilities, routine or challenge inspections, um, are not well founded in normative practice because industry are comfortable with the inspection regime that we've devised to guard their commercial secrets. Governments are comfortable with managed access arrangements we've arranged for inspections to guard their national security um, interests. So it's very important to note that um, the CWC is not just a bunch of you know, shiny, shiny bottom bureaucrats like myself, diplomats who come to Geneva to drink cocktails and negotiate treaties. No, we're not even diplomats who take scientific advice and then present at the table. Scientists and industry were present in negotiations. And we have an ongoing partnership with them in the OPCW. We have a scientific advisory board with whom we work to source best possible advice on new developments of interest to how we implement the convention. Um, we are trying to revitalize our partnerships with industry to streamline compliance, their compliance with our obligations. I personally would like to see, I don't know how we do this, I would like to see industry see what they do with us as something fashionable. I'm always impressed by uh, advertisements in The Economist of what Sh um, Exxon and Shell are doing that doesn't even mention hydrocarbons. I mean, we need to have some sort of narrative that we can share with industry that shows the importance of um, a proactive culture of uh, not guarding against bad science, but promoting good science. Um, this is something we're very focused on. We also um, are working much more so with civil society. I think Jean-Pascal will be more qualified to speak about this from his perspective. I don't want to give a propagandist uh, perspective from, from uh, the bureaucrat's point of view. But one thing we had just recently in, uh, in uh, The Hague was an education outreach conference. What we want is to um, in get proactive engagement from the scientific community in the sense that it becomes instinctive for the up-and-coming generation of scientists to be alert to the potential for the misuse of sciences, to be alert to the broader strategic context in which they work. There should be no such thing as a scientific specialist um, who sits like a laboratory rat and does his or her research without understanding the context that it affects. We need to have more well-rounded people. Diplomats have to understand science better, um, and uh, scientists have to be able to communicate what they do better to policymakers. This is a major priority for how we better guard against the re-emergence of chemical weapons in the future. There is, of course, one other imperative currently guiding the work of the OPCW and its member states I've not yet mentioned. That is achieving universal adherence to the CWC, especially in the wake of events in Syria. 
Only six states, as we've heard, still remain outside the convention, Angola, Egypt, Israel, Myanmar, North Korea, and South Sudan. To give you an update, of these, Myanmar and Angola are close to exceeding with relevant documents currently before their parliaments. Myanmar, like Israel, is a signatory to the CWC. It now has a ratification uh, process underway. We are hopeful that it will be completed uh, um, in coming weeks, uh, ideally. Angola, likewise, has become rather more focused on the fact that it hasn't that it's not a member state of the CWC and some other arms control treaties uh, because of it having uh, won a seat, a temporary seat on the Security Council, which it takes up in January. And this has been, of course, of great assistance for our representations. South Sudan has no concerns with the CWC. Obviously, it has other priorities on its plate. We had some engagement with them before the current civil conflict. We're very confident that once that conflict is, uh, is in abeyance, we'll be able to proceed with CWC ratification. Obviously, we'll need to package it with other things of interest to South Sudan because, um, as I mentioned, as a new state, it has a lot of priorities for getting governments going. This will leave Egypt, Israel, and North Korea. I won't co comment on the company. I think uh, um, Paul already has. These countries will, like all countries, make their own decision about their security and their stance vis-a-vis -vis the CWC. But of course, until they do, they'll not be able to fully remove doubts about their intentions in relation to the global ban against chemical weapons. And given the well-established international norm against them, chemical weapons should not be the subject of ambiguity or be used as a bargaining chip. It's our strong sense that with the removal of the threat posed by serious chemical arsenal, it is time for all states still outside the convention to join without delay and without preconditions. On this point, it's also worth noting that throughout the course of the mission to eliminate serious chemical weapons, the OBCW was very conscious of what our mandate in Syria entailed. This was and remains to achieve Syria's full chemical disarmament. Nothing more, or as I prefer to say, nothing less, for there can't be any doubt that removing chemical weapons from a country where they have been used will deliver valuable humanitarian and security benefits. While this, of course, will not resolve the conflict in Syria, we shouldn't lose sight of the fact that the international community was able to agree on only one aspect of the conflict to date, chemical demilitarization. If nothing else, this lays clear testimony to the strength of the global consensus against chemical weapons. So in conclusion, let me leave you with this. The nature of some of the changes in the strategic environment that I've outlined here amply demonstrate that the OPCW will continue to have a critical role to play well into the future. For it's one thing to achieve global chemical disarmament, but it's equally important to ensure that this achievement is made irreversible. In other words, that we made, make our disarmament gains permanent. To do this, we'll need to be more responsive to changing strategic circumstances and emerging challenges with a far broader, more engaged community of stakeholders, especially civil society. We also need to have all countries on board to help make this effort as well-informed and as effective as possible. And I'll leave it there. Thank you very much for your attention. Um, I will open the floor for questions. And as I said earlier, uh, I would urge people, if they'd like to ask questions, just put your sign up. And, uh, and I, I see one or a couple already. Um, let, me, let me just lead off. Um, Peter, I'd like to, I mean, the, the, I think the, the really key issue uh, for Israel in the Middle East here is the, the big success of the Syrian demilitarization operation. And um, I'm wondering, you know, from your personal perspective, uh, are you really confident today that, that Syria has declared all of its chemical weapons is the OPCW confident Syria has declared all of its chemical weapons? And uh, if not, um, what, you know, what more can we all do? Uh, what, more, what more do we need to do to, um, to prove, in fact, that uh, Syria is completely chemical weapons free today? I mean, the OPCW works on the basis of declarations provided by its state's parties. So basically, when you accede to the CWC, as Syria did recently, and if you exceed as a chemical weapon possessor state, you're obliged to prepare an initial declaration of all your stocks and production facilities within 30 days. 
Um, Syria did this. We've been working very closely with them. Now, there have been questions raised in the context, it's no secret to anybody, um, by some states' parties in the context of our very regular meetings on Syria. In fact, we've been having monthly meetings of the Executive Council in the OPCW to date. And the Secretary General has been providing monthly reports to the Sec Security General, Secretary General of the UN. Um, and uh, we, as a matter of course, are following up questions in relation to the declaration. Um, we have had um, a series of meetings um, uh, in Beirut and in Damascus with Syrian officials to fine-tune the declaration. And uh, that's ongoing work, and it's work that's been going, uh, proceeding a pace you know, quite well. Um, in some cases, and I won't go into detail, it's a matter of also understanding how you do a declaration, what is declarable. And, uh, of course, for any new state party, that can be quite um, a daunting task. Um, I, I don't make any excuses for the Syrian side or how it did its accounting practices. I'm, I've not been involved in declarations, but certainly um, what I can say is that Syria is in the tent and it has obligations as a state party to make sure its declaration is uh, uh, as complete as possible, um, and uh, we are still working on that uh, as a matter of course, and that's ongoing work. Um, in, in terms of how sure can we be, I mean, well, I mean, as I mentioned, we work on the basis of declarations, and uh, um, we don't have access, we rely on our state's parties to provide information that might be of relevance to help us in that task. Yeah, and I'm sure I'm sure we're going to have a lot more questions on the Syrian operation, and we'll I'll talk about this briefly too in our next I think it's our next panel when I talk about uh, chemical weapons demilitarization. Uh, that will be oh, the third maybe it's the third. Okay, um, Hillo, I think you were you were first. Okay, please. First of all, I'd really like to thank uh, Sharon and Paul and everybody else who's involved in organizing this because I'd like to say that for myself, I've been active since 1981-82 in uh, the whole question of nuclear weapons and weapons of mass destruction with New Outlook, with the Palestine Israel Journal now, with the Physicians for Prevention of Nuclear War, and I admit I know hardly anything about chemical weapons. So I think this is a very important initiative, and once again, thank you. And I have a question about this. Um, we, Sharon mentioned the fact that we all remember uh, wearing gas masks in 1981, etc. Whatever happened to the Iraqi chemical weapons program? Presumably, it's been eliminated, but how did that happen? As second. Uh, Egypt, we know, once used chemical weapons in Yemen. In the 1960s. What? Yes, I know. What happened to that program? The, I mean, these are questions that an average Israeli would be curious about. Has Iran ever been suspected of having a chemical weapons program? Those three questions, I think, uh, at least for me, would be very important to hear. Okay, well, I'll, I'll give the perspective, obviously, from the OPCW. I mean, others might have, might want to be more expansive, I mean, uh, from, by sourcing other information. I mean, in relation to Iraq, I mean, Iraq joined the Chemical Weapons Convention in 2007, I think, and it declared remnants, 2009, 2009 sorry, 2009, and it declared um, uh, remnants of chemical weapons. Um, so we're now working with Iraq to... Uh, a finalized um, a destruction program for those remnants of chemical weapons. Um, some facilities have been declared. Um, we've obviously had some, uh, we've not been able to get physical access to some of those facilities uh, to date. And obviously, the um, security situation of recent months has complicated issues, th these things further. Iraq has obviously been keeping states' parties abreast of that in the context of Executive Council meetings in The Hague. Um, well, we can't really comment on Egypt. Egypt is not a state party of the CWC, so um, you know, we have no information in relation to uh, programs past or present, potentially. And in relation to Iran, Iran is a state party to the CWC and uh, is a non-possessor state, um, has submitted a declaration and is subject to the same obligations as all states parties of the convention. Thank you very much, and uh, thank you for the introductions. One question to... Uh, the chairpersons, is it okay to be interactive to other questions too, or, uh, 
Okay, because um, f in follow-up to Peter's uh, presentation, which was uh, really a nice overview of uh, issues and uh, future challenges, uh, there were uh, two points that actually uh, came to my mind, which I, I think for, for this audience is uh, important to realize. Very often in, in the press, you're going to hear, you know, uh, a decade, two decades ago, Iraq had the largest stockpile in the world, then Libya had the largest stockpile, now it's uh, Syria uh, and so forth. I think it's uh, very important to bear in mind that over the past uh, two, three decades, that what is the largest stockpile has actually redu been reduced uh, considerably. In the case of the United States, we were talking about uh, 30,000 agent metric tons. Uh, uh, the Soviet Union, it was 40,000 agent metric tons. Once these were starting to be reduced, then the uh, threat volume of a chemical arsenal was reduced to something like uh, a thousand uh, tons, even a few hundred uh, tons. That was, I mean, Iraq had a few thousands produced over the time of uh, the war with uh, Iran. But, uh, you know, that was reduced. Sir I mean, Libya was like 25 tons of, of mustard agent, which is, in terms of a warfare arsenal, very small. Uh, Syria, 1,300 tons, 1,300 tons of uh, precursor chemicals. So wh what I'm saying is, even as we are uh, looking towards disarmament and people are identifying new threats, the threats are always lower. In Syria, what we're talking about now as potential threats is uh, opportunistic use of industrial toxicants, uh, such as uh, chlorine. So it, it, it's really going down. There's still issues, and it moves away from strategic uh, threats to um, threats that I would identify as the possibility of harming individuals. Uh, which is quite different in terms of uh, security definition. So could you define or explain in terms like agent and precursor chemicals? Sure everybody knows. Okay. Uh, well, uh, a, ke a chemical uh, weapon, uh, it's a generic term, and uh, it can refer to the delivery system. It can uh, refer to a filled delivery system. The toxic agent itself, uh, the sarin, the mustard agent, is the chemical agent. Uh, this is the poisonous substance that's uh, released by uh, the de delivery system. And then uh, precursor chemicals are uh, not the final agent that would be used uh, on the battlefield, but the types of chemicals that you still have to put together for a final reaction in order to get your uh, warfare agent. So in the case of Syria, uh, with the exception of 22 uh, tons of uh, mustard agent uh, were essentially all precursor chemicals. So it was not serine as such, but the products ready to be mixed, uh, have the final reaction and have them put uh, into munitions. Okay. Um, then um, the, the, the other thing uh, I wanted to pick up on in terms of uh, Syria, uh, is uh, probably the interesting uh, information uh, that um, there are no reports that insurgent troops, uh, forces inside Syria, have captured parts of the Syrian chemical weapons stockpile. So uh, there is no evidence whatsoever of that. And the other aspect uh, to bear in mind is that uh, there is no official evidence of the transfer of chemical materials, precursor uh, equipment, uh, and so forth, to insurgents. The reason why I'm saying this is it highlights uh, quite a bit uh, in terms of uh, where the threats and the usage uh, comes from, except for a few incidents of uh, opportunistic use. And then in uh, reply to Hillel, um, uh, wha what's left? In uh, Iraq, uh, we have the, the situation of the al Muthana former chemical weapon production plant. And uh, everything there was destroyed by UNSCOM. That was before the CWC had uh, entered uh, into force. And it's very important uh, to bear in mind that uh, whereas under the CWC, everything must be destroyed with a certainty of 99.9% .9, uh, 
uh, percent uh, destruction. That was not the case under the UN mandate. It was destruction of the munitions. What happened, what is present in Al-Muthana today are remnants of equipment that was used to destroy uh, old barrels with residue of uh, some of the warfare agents but uh, neutralized on the one hand, that's one bunker. The other bunker uh, has 122 millimeter rockets which uh, the Iraq is uh, used for sarin uh, delivery. Uh, these rockets are broken, damaged, there is an uh, unexploded American bomb inside uh, that bunker, uh, which penetrated through the roof. And uh, Sarin was of very poor quality, uh, somewhere between uh, the high 40s uh, and low 60s in terms of purity, which means it degrades uh, very quickly. These bunkers have been completely filled with earth, have been sealed with meters thick uh, walls and also the roof uh, of that hole uh, for the bomb has been done. Which basically means there is a lot of contaminated material there but unusable as a chemical weapon. And if ISIL or any of those troops would try to penetrate, they would actually uh, run grave risk uh, to themselves. The Egyptian uh, program, yes, uh, this is a mystery, but to the best of my knowledge, the chemical weapons factory, which was to the north of uh, Cairo, uh, was closed down by Sadat. Uh, he even refused to have it, re it was mothballed under Sadat. He refused to have it reopened when Saddam Hussein asked the Egyptians uh, for support for their chemical uh, weapon uh, efforts. And to the best of my knowledge, it has become a pharmaceutical plant uh, today. So this is, but more transparency would uh, actually be useful. Iran, towards the end of the Iran-Iraq war, they had a, a small-scale chemical weapon program. Uh, they produced what I would call first-generation chemical warfare agents. These are the types used in the First World War. So we're not talking about nerve agents uh, and uh, so on. And uh, Iran, like many other uh, countries, destroyed that stockpile before entry into force of the Chemical Weapons Convention, so they had nothing uh, to declare. That's the best of my knowledge there.